green business practice, how business can achieve net zero. The government will be looking for the private sector to reduce its emissions in the years to come. But what does it really mean for a business to achieve net zero? Should companies and their sectors account for only their direct emissions or must they also measure their indirect impact related to supply chain or digital carbon footprints? How should businesses address their historic emissions and what might this mean for a once carbon intensive sector? Joining me to discuss all this and more is Tom DeLay, Chief, Chief Executive of the Carbon Trust, Scott Leader, Market Director at VLUX, and Chris Stark, Chief Executive of the Climate Change Committee. Welcome to you all and a big thank you to VLUX for sponsoring this panel. Now for viewers at home, we want to take your questions. I'm going to put them to the panel over the next hour. You can submit them by typing in the text box on Spectator TV or by emailing events at spectator.co.uk. So we're gonna hear a few minutes of opening remarks from each of our panelists. I'll abuse my position as chair for a few minutes with some questions and then we'll get straight to yours. So Tom, why don't you kick us off? Okay, let's just look at net zero. Um, it's an enormously challenging aim. Um, it's many decades out in most cases. And what it means is that uh, the economies of the whole globally need to reduce their carbon emissions very significantly on a pathway to the point at which they've reached virtually nothing. What is left of their emissions, which they cannot reduce, it's really the, the absolute minimum, they then have to find a way of offsetting using greenhouse gas removal. That's not just a straightforward carbon offset. It's actually taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Now, if every organization in every country reduces and achieves net zero, we will globally have achieved net zero. There are some points I'd raise very quickly. Firstly, net zero, there is no single definition for what net zero means, and that does create a number of challenges. Um, you can have net zero on a geographic basis. So the UK can have a net zero target for a geographic uh, view of the, uh, of the country. Most organizations have a value chain that often goes internationally um, from maybe the raw materials to the manufacturing to the distribution and finally the use. So net zero can be along a value chain. It can also be by ge geography. Um, it's enormously challenging. And for most organizations, really, they have to say, look, two things. One, we need to measure our carbon emissions, those that we are directly responsible for, and those are called scope one and two. We also need to measure and understand and take account of scope three emissions, which is everything upstream of us as an organization and everything downstream through to the consumer and, in fact, recycling and waste and so on. Um, so it's a very expansive view of what you have to measure as your carbon emissions. For most organizations, that means in the short term, optimizing what you do, finding ways of being more efficient, using less, emitting less. As you go forward, if you're really going to gradually bring down your carbon emissions to zero, you've actually got to do more than simply optimize today. You've actually got to transform your business at some point. You've got to make some structural changes in almost every case to fundamentally change the nature of the business. But that's being driven along with the rest of society over a number of decades. So that really is the challenge. It's an enormously difficult one. Uh, before we forget that uh, today's global economy is about half of what the global economy will be in about 2050. That's just given economic growth that we're gonna see coming through with a particularly strong growth in Southeast Asia and infrastructure. So not only are we trying to reduce what we have today to nothing, we're trying to reduce something that's going to be a lot bigger to nothing. So businesses have an absolutely key role to play. Uh, there are many, many leaders uh, around the world in many, many different sectors, many of them here in the UK. Uh, we work with over 100 organizations at the moment on helping them understand what near zero means for them, developing pathways, underpinning the claims that they've already made, and maybe deciding what targets are appropriate for them. Um, it's fascinating because working across different sectors with different kinds of organizations, everyone has unique challenges. And to some degree, I think if nothing else, it'd be great this morning just to understand the scope and the boundary of some of those challenges and how different people are facing those. Uh, that's probably enough from me to start with. Well, thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Scott. Uh, thanks, Kate. Um, I, I work for VLUX and those of you who are not familiar, um, we're an international business established in Denmark in 1941, and we employ over 10,000 people across 35 countries. 
and we manufacture uh, roof windows and roof lights. And I'm really happy to be here today to try and share some of the vision that VLUX have on this topic um, and hope that we can inspire others and, and have people have some interest in that. Plus also, we've got some good expertise on the panel and to listen to, to their experts, uh, expert opinion um, on this. And from our foundation, we're built on sustainability. We're built on daylight and fresh air and energy efficiency. Um, however, what we need to do is look at how we manufacture and so does the rest of, of the business world um, too. And why are we looking at this? Um, quite simply, because the world needs it. Um, I think the UN calls the 2020s the decade of action when it comes to climate change and everyone needs to play their part and business plays a big part um, in that. So last September, Felux launched um, a commitment as part of the, our 2030 sustainability strategy, which we actually call Our Nature. And it's to half the carbon used in our products um, and to become a carbon neutral company. Uh, and this is crucial because we work in the construction sector, which contributes 11% of the world's carbon emissions in terms of component manufacturing and construction of buildings. And that's what's called embodied carbon. Uh, but also there's, there's emissions that we're more familiar with, which is a building's lifetime emission, which is around an additional 28%. So that's almost 30 or 39 to 40% of the greenhouse emissions, which construction is accountable for, which shows that our industry really needs to step up and, and make an impact here. And if we're again looking into the future, because that, that's today, but if we look into the future, we also know that the global re real estate um, is going to close to double up to 2000, 2060. Um, and as an industry, we pretty much build Paris every single week. So it's a really important part to our future to make sure that we're, that we're working hard here. Now, we know that this is not easy and the task that we're setting ourselves is difficult and we're under no illusions about how challenging it will be. Um, and we also don't have all the answers yet, but what we need to do is work together with all of our partners and collaborate internally to make sure that we can, we can meet where we want to be. Um, so we look at our internal business practices and we want to be a carbon neutral company in our production by 2030, but we also need to look at our supply chain, scope free, which was discussed a, a second ago. Um, and what we're looking to do there is to reduce the carbon content in our, in our product by 50% by 2030. So if you buy the equivalent product in 2030 compared to now, then that would have 50% less carbon um, content. Um, and then just finally, we're also, as well as looking at future emissions, we're also looking, looking back in the past. So our sustainability strategy has 15 strands to it. And one other I just want to briefly mention is our, our plan to become lifetime carbon neutral by 2041, which will be our 100th year anniversary, because we feel it's also important to address the future as well as repay the historic carbon debt. Um, and we're working with World Wildlife Fund on this to undertake a series of reforestation and conservation projects um, around the world. Uh, I think that's it from me. Thank you. Thanks very much, Scott. Over to you, Chris. Thanks, Kate. And thanks to Tom and Scott as well. So I just I thought it might be worth just kind of stepping back a bit and, ask, and, and asking a, a couple of questions about what we actually need to do to get to net zero, because it, it involves a lot of things happening uh, in unison. And it's worth just thinking for a second about why we're doing all this. I mean, the, the reason that uh, we have this problem is, 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 is because we are using assets at the moment, technologies at the moment that burn fossil fuels. So if we want to get to net zero, we need to swap those assets. This is the cars that we drive, the boilers, the vans, the plant and machinery that we use in industry for zero carbon versions of those assets. So actually, I think it's worth uh, starting with that challenge that it, it is a, an asset turnover challenge, an investment challenge that, um, that faces us here in the UK and around the world in getting to net zero. There's a bit more to it than that, but that is a large part of, of what needs to be done. And, and I think that's at, at the heart of why these corporate commitments to net zero are so important. So if we just look at that for a second, the average life of a, a capital asset that uses fossil fuels today, if you bought something new, is 15 to 20 years. So something bought today is likely to still be in use by 2040. 
So that's the challenge. If we want to get to net zero by mid-century, and if we want that transition to be well-managed, inexpensive, uh, with the, the minimum of disruption, then what we need is a plan that, that turns over those capital assets from high carbon versions to zero carbon versions as quickly as possible, but also in a, in a well-managed way as possible. And, and if we think in that way about it, you can ask lots of interesting questions then about how to do that. What's the appropriate policy to do that? What role might industry have in that? What role might the consumer have in it? We estimate that it, that, that investment challenge uh, is about an extra fifty billion pounds of capital investment each year for the for the UK economy, um, and that is a big number. That's adding an eighth overall to the capex in the UK economy, um, and that needs to be the number that we get to by about twenty thirty. So from twenty thirty onwards, uh, that kind of investment challenge is what is is is, is, is it will get us to net zero, getting to that kind of uh, that kind of level of investment overall. And 2030 is really the key date because if we're ready by 2030 to stop selling and installing those high carbon assets and moving now exclusively to zero carbon assets, then we'll make it on time. Uh, and so that kind of period, that decade that um, that's got talked about is absolutely right. This is the decade of action because we need to get to the point by 2030 when we're ready to uh, to, to replace and earnest those assets that we that we buy and use and those technologies that we use at the moment. So the corporate plans for net zero are absolutely critical for that. I would love to see this taken more seriously in boardrooms, not just a CSR thing, but a genuinely meaningful strand to corporate strategies. We need businesses to invest. We need, we need them also to take account of the emissions that they are responsible for. Uh, for many businesses, that is going to be a fundamental shift. The logic of this is that businesses themselves need to make the transition, uh, not that they are, you know, put out of business or that they have to, you know, that they're in, that they face difficulties, but actually they go along with this and then come out at the end of it in a decarbonized way, fit for the kind of modern economy. So it's tempting to think of all this as a policy challenge, but it really isn't, of course. It's 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 about a, a number of parties, including our, our corporate community, going along with that. Broadly, we see the government's role as providing the framework for all of this. So providing the policies, uh, the, the right incentives, the support uh, with public money where, where, where necessary to make the kind of transition that we've just talked about. Uh, and then business is there, the private sector is what drives the transition. So it's, it's decarbonizing operations that it's responsible for directly, especially by moving, uh, for example, vehicle fleets to electric vehicles, that kind of thing. It's about fostering the innovation that we'll need for all of this as well, especially using procurement to drive down emissions. Um, a whole set of things also that can nudge the, the customers of our corporates uh, towards low carbon choices too. And, and the key thing in all of this is that the business's commitments need to be aligned with the, the pathway that the country is on. Not actually that, not so much that the businesses sign up to net zero themselves, but they're aligned with the changes that the whole economy needs to make to get to net zero. And, and there's a set of things you can do that, but it starts with doing the basics, measuring your emissions, disclosing them, targeting action in, the, in, in your own company in the right way, then adopting uh, the highest possible ambition that you can for cutting emissions uh, in the business. Uh, and if possible, even going beyond scope three, which might seem an interesting and, uh, and difficult thing to do, but in particular driving the, 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 the transition that we need across the UK yourself with the corporate commitments that you can make, for example, leading that transition to electric vehicles in the UK, switching vehicle fleets over to electric vehicles before the, the, the kind of deadlines that the country is making, yeah, using corporate renewable procurement uh, to, to establish new uh, 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 solar uh, and, 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 and wind uh, installations in the UK to help the country make that transition too. That's the kind of secret here in getting to net zero quickly. And it won't happen, of course, unless climate change as is an issue is sitting at, at the top the top level of corporate leadership being discussed uh, at board level uh, in, in an active way. So it's, a, I mean, we're at the, the start of this journey now and it's just, it's just really exciting to think that way. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we already have questions rolling in, which is fantastic. A reminder to our watchers at home uh, or, or in your office uh, is that if you would like to submit a question, you can do so via the text box on Spectator TV or you can email events at spectator.co.uk. Um, but just to throw a few questions out there first, Tom, you mentioned in your opening remarks that there were differing definitions um, when it comes to net zero. How well do you think businesses understand exactly what net zero or even those different definitions mean, particularly when it comes to things like supply chains and indirect 
emissions? Do you think businesses have the awareness to know that it isn't just about their direct emissions, but it's about their, their wider reaching impact on the climate? Uh, I think most businesses nowadays um, want to align themselves with best practice. And there is best practice definition for net zero that applies for the vast majority of sectors and therefore organizations, wherever you are in the world. And that is to um, set a pathway to reduce your carbon emissions through a science-based target out to 2050, maybe earlier than that. Uh, follow that science-based target. Now, the science-based target approach requires you to look at both your own direct emissions, scope one and two, and also your upstream and downstream emissions, scope three. Um, the majority of organizations, the minute they start looking into net zero, realize that that is best practice. Um, in many cases, they focus on the short term, which has a great deal of value to it because actually getting going is often the most difficult thing. Measuring, setting targets, doing those early steps to optimize your current business. And to some degree, they then need to develop options for the future. Yes, the majority of organizations do understand that it's not just scope one and two, it's scope three. Those who to some degree resist it, in some cases, it's because they find it very hard to see how they can influence scope three. The reality is that virtually every organization can influence scope three and has to. Um, I think the point was well made. You know, we are basically using uh, natural resources in a very inefficient way today. Uh, we developed today's economy uh, at a time when natural resources, including, you know, dare I say it, the atmosphere um, that, that we enjoy, um, was abundant, it was cheap. If we didn't look at the materials use, at the energy use, you just assumed it was all gonna be available. If you were to redefine today's economy to meet the needs that we all have as citizens, as consumers, um, and as businesses, you'd do it in a far more efficient way because you'd be aware of the cost of some of the things that you're using in a, in a pretty wasteful way. So start from there. Uh, there is enormous opportunity in almost every uh, organization. The vast majority of businesses we work with will work to best practice, which is a science-based target leading to net zero at some point in future. For those who can't at the moment do that, there are a number of different proxies. And I like Chris's point about it's contributing to net zero globally that is almost as important as doing it yourself. Um, that is important. There are organizations that are going to struggle to get to net zero and shrink because they are actually growing a, a wind turbine manufacturer. And yet we want more wind turbines. Um, and so at that point, you've got to look at exactly what works. Carbon neutrality is a very useful measure as well. If you are carbon neutral and you continue to be carbon neutral, then eventually you will move towards net zero. Um, but um, I, I would say, yes, there is best practice. The definitions aren't uh, singular. People will use that sometimes as a, hang on, is this for a country, for a city, for a state, for a company? It, it doesn't really matter. Get into it and it's fairly straightforward. And the vast majority of businesses, not just very large businesses, but increasingly smaller businesses, have a particular drive to do this and it can come from their investors from their employees or from their consumers it, it, you know, the information is widely available chris a recent report from the climate change committee found that government was not on track to be meeting its targets and to be achieving net zero that was the assessment of government policy and where, where they're at in in this journey What's your broader sense assessment of, of business? Are the right policies being implemented in the private sector to get us to the targets that we've set? Yeah, that's a really interesting question and important to say that, you know, it's not our role to make an assessment of the progress that the business community is making on net zero. I mean, I suppose the answer to your question straightforwardly is no, they're not doing enough, because then no one is. So, so that there's a kind of collective need to, to raise the ambition and, and to actually deliver against it. The, the, the signs and the targets that have been set in the UK. But I, I, I suppose I'm, a bit of nuance to that is that um, we are seeing now much more of a corporate drive towards tackling net zero uh, and even the broader discussion of, of the impact of the corporate community on the environment. And that is, that is a new thing, I think. And there's a couple of things behind that. I mean, it's definitely the case that larger corporates in the UK are, are now much more focused on net zero as a topic than they ever were before. And that's really happened in the last couple of years. Uh, some of what's driving that, of course, is the, you know, the social awareness of the issues, uh, the general drive towards net zero, which the corporate community are picking up on and acting on. But a part of it is also being driven by the need to um, actively think about it and to disclose some of the risks that are faced by the corporate community. So 
we have this new uh, set of financial disclosure rules, the TCFD rules, um, which are, are going to be mandatory at some stage and, and, and drive, I think, a much better and, uh, and really useful understanding of the extent to which uh, a business is exposed to climate change itself. So thinking in particular about financial institutions here, whose assets will be uh, damaged and impacted by the, the change in the climate that's coming. But also, and I think much more intriguingly for this discussion, the, the transition risk, that is how exposed is that business, how exposed are the assets of that business to the, to the move from where we are today to zero carbon itself. And I think that is, that's great from my perspective because it's driving a much better sense of the realistic economics here, the, kind of the, the need to be commercially aware of those risks which is in turn driving a, a, a move towards what we can actually do about it and, and the need to act on it. So back to my other point, getting to net zero involves a lot of things happening at once. It's often the case that we point to the government as being you know, the, the primary actors here. And I do think it's important that governments around the world lead a lot of this. But it is not the case that government is solely responsible for the actions that will need to take place. In fact, it's much more about the government shaping those actions uh, in the real economy and that will happen if if we have a unison between the policies that government make uh, the targets of course that government has set and then you know the, the the willingness of of our corporate community especially to to drive that and to make the investments i talked about earlier now i think a lot of that to be positive for a second is now moving in the right direction we were critical of the government uh, last week uh, but we did that in the knowledge that there is a space for them to address our concerns over the next uh, weeks, months, weeks and months prior to COP26. If, we, if that happens, if we have a national strategy for net zero, which we don't have at the moment, then I think it will be very clear what, what, what the role of the corporate community can be on that transition. And I, and I expect things to move much more quickly after that. Mm. Scott, we've seen a rise in shareholders demanding companies get tougher on their emissions. Do you think that drive from shareholders is making a big difference? I think the drive is from everywhere, um, not just from share, shareholders, also from the market. It's also from consumers. Um, I read a report uh, last week that a lot of consumers think that they're doing the, the best they can and now they need business to, to take this on. So, of course, from the top with the shareholders pushing this down, there's something that's really important to business that will help. But I think the drive is actually from the whole community um, and the whole market in general. Um, Tom, we have a question in from Jane asking uh, about the infrastructure that's going to need to be in place by 2030, 2040 for these net zero aspirations to come to life. Now, the government is inevitably going to have some role to play in that. But when we're talking about electric vehicles, for example, the private sector has a big role to play as well. Do you think they're up to the challenge? Um, I, I, absolutely, they're up to the challenge. I mean, the heavy lifting in any transformation to net zero, uh, developing low carbon products and services of the future is going to be done by the private sector. Uh, government can shape um, the environment in which people can invest to achieve that outcome, uh, but it's going to be the private sector that's going to do the heavy lifting uh, and is absolutely up for this. And I think the reasons, uh, let's go back very briefly. Um, five years ago, we had a Paris Agreement. That was terrific in that it actually brought together governments, corporates, and financial institutions with a common aim. That common aim and alignment uh, has been incredibly powerful over the last few years. And gradually, uh, governments have come together around the world. And now there are really very few governments who are outliers to the Paris Agreement and what it means in terms of bringing everybody together. That's important because many businesses are global businesses and they actually need to see a global response from government to allow them to get on with the investment they need to make. The next thing we saw was Greta who came along and quietly but very efficiently told the world that there is a generational issue here and that the voters of the future, the consumers of the future, and dare I say it, the savers of the future are very much aligned with the need to address the environment's challenges and become net zero. And lastly, COVID. Um, most of us looked at COVID and went, is this going to be a setback or is this going to be a step forward? Most people would have guessed a step back. In practice, it's a step forward in terms of momentum. For a number of reasons, people feel more closely aligned to the natural environment at the moment. People recognize that this is no longer a, must, a, a nice to have, it's a must have. And lastly, and most importantly, people are looking now to governments to stimulate economic growth 
And you might as well do economic growth with a purpose. And there is no better purpose than achieving this. So the private sector are absolutely up for this. And I'm just going to come back to the financial side. You know, there was a time not so long ago when investors would simply look at financial returns. It's becoming increasingly clear that financial returns are under risk if you don't embrace and understand what you're investing in from an environmental perspective. You're now getting to the point where the cost of capital is higher for organizations who don't embrace net zero and don't move the right direction. It's something called cost of capital drag. So basically, your business is going to become more expensive to run if you don't move along with everybody else in this direction of travel. So it's, it's an incredibly powerful tool. And a combination, as Scott was saying, of consumers increasingly asking for it, um, investors demanding it. And dare I say it, employees of almost every organization that we work with saying, this is something we care about. Um, it, it brings everything together. So yeah, businesses are absolutely up for it in virtually every sector. The most heavily carbon intensive sectors are the ones we need to focus on because they have real challenges. In some cases, there is no transformation that they can make without completely reinventing their business model. Chris, we have quite a few questions coming in about technology and the reliance on technology to get to net zero that hmm. may not exist yet. I think this ties into Jane's infrastructure question about things that are going to be needed in the future that we simply don't have yet. How difficult is it to legislate or come up with public policy to meet this target when we are talking about things that simply haven't been developed yet? Well, I would challenge that, actually, the premise of that altogether. I mean, there are several things that we don't have operating at scale at the moment in the UK economy that, we'll, that we will need to get to net zero. But we went in designing the, a plan for net zero, or at least a, an outline of a plan for net zero, uh, we set ourselves the task of ensuring that we could get to net zero using technologies that we already knew would work or were aware of. And, and the, the, the uh, 2019 work that led to the setting of the net zero target for the UK was based only on those technologies. Now, important to say that there will be new technologies that will come along. They will help us on the way, and I hope that will help us get to net zero even faster. But we don't need to rely on things that haven't yet been invented to get to net zero. And that's quite a reassuring thing because it means that we can start to plan in earnest for a transition over the next 20 years that really does need to take place now. And as those new things come along, we can switch the strategy towards those, uh, those technologies that look even more productive. But let's just look at the kind of technologies that sit underneath that. The, the top, top, top priority for the UK, and it has been the top priority, notably for the last 15 years, 20 years, is to decarbonize the electricity system. So going back to your earlier question to Tom about infrastructure, every corporate in the UK should know that the electricity that, that, that will be available for that corporate over the course of the next 10, 15 years uh, will eventually get to zero carbon. So we said in our most recent work that by 2035, we should stop burning unabated fossil fuels to generate electricity in this country. That's the point where we'll have zero carbon electricity. Mm -hmm. It's also the point that Joe Biden, the, the date that Joe Biden has set for the US. So there's a kind of common view that really that by around the mid 2030s, electricity will be fully decarbonized. That means that any industry using that electricity will be zero carbon. So it's, it's exciting to think that way about it because it means that a lot of the, a lot of the hard work is being done somewhere else. But there are other, other areas where we are going to need to do more, much more than, than just rely on electricity to get to, to zero carbon. And, and the top of those areas is, is what we call um, greenhouse gas removals. And this is definitely one of the, you know, the most controversial topics when it comes to net zero. We know we'll need to do some what we would call in the trade removals to get to net zero. That's because we can't get all emissions to actual zero, especially notably emissions in farming, uh, also probably emissions in aviation. Uh, for long distance, long haul flights, it's difficult to imagine a world where we're not continuing to use fossil fuels. Although there are lots of people who would like to see that happen, it's unlikely to happen at the pace it needs to by mid-century. So we need offsets of some type. Uh, now we can grow a lot of trees, of course. Uh, we need to do that in any case, but we also need something over and above that, which is the, the greenhouse gas removals. Now that there is a collection of technologies there uh, that will help with that that will take uh, carbon from the, from the air or from the, 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 the plants that we can grow in this country and then, and then actually sequester that carbon and put it back where we, we had oil and gas deposits. Uh, those technologies exist. 
Uh, we know they work, we just haven't done them commercially at scale. So I think those are the things that need the attention and support of policymakers and in turn will need the commercial investment to drive that. But I'm pretty confident we'll have it. And uh, the UK is one of the best places in the world to do a lot of this. And it's also, you know, we're pretty far down the track of supporting some of these things too. So I don't regard these as kind of unicorn technologies, really. They're, they're there, they're, they will be ready to go as long as the commercial models are there. So I think other than that, I don't see this big technological gap that occasionally people, people refer to, because I think net zero itself is driving the kind of innovation that we need. Uh, it, uh, amongst many of those technologies for heat, for example, technologies and in industry towards a more decarbonized future. And the last thing I'll say in this is that a lot of the technologies that we will use in our net zero economy are much, much, much more efficient. So actually, it's, it's a straightforward, simple, easy decision to move from what is quite an inefficient use of, of, of fossil fuels to much more efficient technologies that typically use electricity. And with that comes the saving. So this investment that I, kept, I keep talking about does have a big payoff once you have those new uh, those new zero carbon assets operating in the business because the operating costs of those technologies tends to be much lower than the alternatives. So I'm excited about all this on a number of grounds, but one of the one of the main grounds for being excited about this is that it is it is a step towards a more efficient economy in the round, which of course is good for us in the long term. Scott, Chris mentioned commercial investment there. What is the right balance here when it comes to stumping up the cash? The private sector, and if we are going to be able to, to pay for this overall, is, is going to have to play a, a large role in that. But I've had several questions coming in through the text box saying, you know, who is going to pay for this? Is it going to be the taxpayer? Is it going to be private companies? What do you think the right balance, balance is? And when it comes to a company like Velux, what are the ethical responsibilities in the private sector to, to help fund all of these changes? Yeah, it's tricky for me to to understand what the right balance would be because it's probably going to cost everyone, you know, a bit as it goes along. From a from a business point of view and from Velux point of view, um, we will invest the amount that we need to to meet our promises, um, and I think that that's significant. That's a significant amount um, of money. But as I think the other guys were talking about earlier on, it's something that we have to do. It's something that are, you know, the governments are doing it, something that the market demands, something that my children demand as well, by the way. Um, I'm always under pressure from, from my children about uh, sustainability and the, the strategy there. So I think the cost is, is not as difficult. I think it, the balance will be a little bit of everybody will probably pay a bit of that. But in the long term for business, we have to do this um, to keep in business and to keep growing um, as a business. Mm. Uh, Tom, we've had a question through uh, from Paul asking whether or not net zero is a useful term, especially in the business community, because it can lead to greenwashing. I mean, I think we see this quite frequently, actually. Net zero has become, a, you know, a, a buzz phrase. Um, it's something uh, that people love to use to show or signal that they're trying to be greener. But actually, sometimes it actually ends up meaning nothing at all when you actually uh, dig into the content of it. So do you think it's a helpful phrase? Or do you think that it's just useful for PR spin sometimes? Um, well, I hope it's never used for PR spin. Um, it, it is because it's a powerful concept. But it's a concept that only works if we all understand it and, and stick by the rules, as it were. Um, I think there are a couple of things. Firstly, um, there are a lot of organizations who set net zero targets and aspirations, declared a climate emergency, um, frankly, without due consideration to what it really means. Um, in many cases, those organizations are now having to be more transparent. Uh, Chris talked about TCFD being a corporate uh, submission that is now going to be expected of listed companies in the UK and indeed around the world. Similar things are being applied. Um, so disclosure is going to be required as a corporate uh, requirement, but I think actually consumers and employees also expect a great deal of transparency on this. Um, you know, it, it, in most areas of, of business life, um, you don't share your best secrets with your competitors. Um, that's all commercially confidential. Um, in the area of environment and sustainability, that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable to anybody, to stakeholders, to consumers, to your own employees. So transparency is really important. So um, greenwash is, is a real risk. Um, I think net zero 
will be held to account by a whole number of people. Um, greenwash, we need to be really, really careful of. And the test I use, um, which is interesting, is one that a number of analysts have used looking at different organizations where they've looked and they said, well, that looks like a good plan. Yeah, that kind of is okay. And then they question the sincerity. And there is a difference between something which is a plausible plan where technically all the bits would hang together, but where you just don't get a sense that the organization has committed itself to that future. And something where the organization clearly has got the plan, has got all the targets and the milestones in place, but is also sincere in its aim. Now, sincerity is a strange term to use in business, uh, even stranger to use in the world of finance. And yet it is widely being used at the moment in the world of finance. So yes, net zero is crucial. The definition is a very good one. We need to be incredibly careful that Greenwash doesn't take hold of it. Um, and it's up to all of us, whoever we are, wherever we are, to call out organizations if they cannot support a net zero claim by a plausible and a sincere aim to get that down uh, over time. What do you think, Chris? Is net zero losing its meaning as it's just uh, slapped on as a slogan and used as a PR shtick? I mean, I think I, I, it's worth saying, I, I do think that is a risk because it, it is only a meaningful concept if it's being followed meaningfully, uh, just as Tom says. I, and I, I suppose this is the, this is the, the tension here is that, that, that we have these corporate commitments for net zero, which are great, but actually what we need is a, a global commitment to net zero, otherwise the, you know, we're going to continue to see climate changes. I mean, that's the science. And until we reach net zero emissions globally, we will continue to warm the planet and continue to cause climate change. Now, if you're a huge corporate, then it is a meaningful thing to sign up to net zero. So the likes of, I don't know, Microsoft's commitment is one of the better ones, I think, you know, the kind of really meaningful commitment there. But if, if you're a smaller corporate, and that is, of course, the vast majority of corporates around the world, then it, it starts to lose its meaning. As a, as, a, as a concept in and of itself. Hence my point earlier that what really matters is aligning yourself in whatever sector you are, aligning your business with, with the plan for net zero for the UK. Let's talk about the UK. So that means doing what you can to push that national plan for net zero along as quickly as possible. And it raises, I suppose, the, the, kind of the, the, other, the other important parts of, of this discussion, which is that, that one that we talked about in my last answer, uh, the use of offsets um, and offsets are useful at the moment because in many uh, in many sectors it's not possible to get to zero emissions and um, the use of offsets is is a, is a meaningful addition into the strategy but what we really need to do and it, this might sound counterintuitive is is to progressively phase out those offsets and instead focus on on, on permanent emission reductions so that's some of the work that we've done recently is to look at how quickly we can do that so Corporates who are using offsets alone to get to net zero are not, I would say, meeting the test that Tom has just told you about. Uh, if there is a plan to progressively uh, move away from using offsets towards actual emissions reductions, then that's the kind of meaningful plan that will support the, the UK strategy for net zero as a whole. And again, if we see that kind of move around the world, then we will see corporates drive the transition to net zero even more quickly. But that, that offsets discussion is, I think, one of the critical things in the, in the overall plan for net zero, not just here in the UK, but around the world. If it is only achieved uh, through the use of offsets, then I don't think net zero is a meaningful um, uh, a strategy in the round. But I, I, I sense that, 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 the, that the corporate leaders, at least, are understanding that more and more now. Mm. Scott, Felix is aiming for something called lifetime carbon neutral. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so we're looking back um, to 1941, where we started um, as a business to also repay some of the carbon emis uh, emissions from the past. Um, and it's really tricky, actually, because there's, there's no particular way of measuring that. So we have worked with partners to try and put something together so we can try and measure that in the right way and get that into the into um, something that we can truly have a baseline uh, figure and also having auditors having a look at the calculations to see where that goes but we we feel that just doing something now and in the future is not enough we also wanted to pay back um, our lifetime carbon emissions too. <laughs> 
Scott, surely that's going to be very difficult for some of the largest historic polluters. Yeah, but I guess I can only look at our business. Um, I'm sure that, you know, that's that's tricky. It's tricky for us as well to actually um, really get that get that right. Um, we also signed up to the uh, Science Based Targets Initiative um, 2 as well. And we also are being audited um, on that as well. But I think that we we feel from our business and our sector that we can do that um, now um, and, and do it in a good way. Tom, what do you think? I mean, for some sectors, um, it will be an easier job than others, certainly something to applaud. But um, for many, the focus is just going to be on how they can make their business sustainable in a, in a, in a far more green climate going forward, um, you know, with very little time at the moment to really be looking back. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you're quite right to point out that for some sectors, it's going to be more difficult than others. Um, Chris mentioned Microsoft. Uh, to some degree, they're the poster child for net zero. Um, massive sincerity if you just look at how they announced the plan with enormous transparency, the leadership of the company speaking as one off the hymn sheet. But perhaps more importantly, two other things. One, to greenhouse gas removals, this end of the line, real moving out greenhouse gas uh, is from the atmosphere and sequestering them. Um, yes, there are lots of nature-based solutions. There are a number of geological solutions. There are also a number of technologies, literally chemical processes, whereby you will strip carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They don't really exist at scale today. Microsoft came along and said, look, it's a core part of our net zero strategy. We're a big organization. They've committed a billion dollars to research in exactly that aspect of the end of the story. But they've also said, we will clear our historic debt. From, from the outset of, of Microsoft, we're going to do it by 2050. That's an enormously ambitious thing to say, and, and you've got to congratulate Velux for following pretty much the same logic. Um, but the reality is that they can do it because their footprint is not that enormous. So I can think that clearing your historic debt is something that you can do in certain companies and certain sectors. It will be very hard to see an oil and gas company able to do that. If an oil and gas company can make three things happen, significantly uh, enhance and reduce demand for oil and gas products in the first place, then develop clean energy as a solution to replace the fossil fuels that are there as quickly as you possibly can. And lastly, retire the old as quickly as you can. It's all very well saying we'll do it in 20 years time. If there is a way of replacing the bad with the good now, do it and retire it. And for instance, coal, there are a number of mechanisms around the world being used to financially incentivize people to actually retire coal assets early. That's an enormous win for the atmosphere. It's an enormous win for us all. We just got to make it happen. So I, I think your point's well made. Um, I don't think every sector is going to be able to repay its historic debt. I think the most important thing of all is that we stop using the dirtiest fossil fuels as quickly as we can. Mm. Uh, just a reminder to our watchers that we have just over 15 minutes left. So if you do want to submit uh, any last minute questions, please put them into the text box on Spectator TV or email them to events at spectator.co.uk. Um, Chris, I've had a few questions through about what this is going to cost to the consumer. And it's something that always comes up when we're talking about the net zero targets and rightfully so, because people just don't know yet. Yeah. Um, they haven't been told to what extent this is really going to cost them. And I don't think they totally believe certain politicians who come out and say, look, you know, it won't cost you a penny. This is all going to be <laughs> seamless. Um, I thought your report last week did quite a good job in, in highlighting um, some of those tougher trade-offs that we're going to have to talk about eventually, especially when it comes to meat consumption, when it comes to how we heat our homes. Topics that the government hasn't wanted to touch yet. But of course, businesses will also be wary to touch them because it's not very popular to say to your consumer, some of whom will have been with you for decades, that you're going to hike their prices. Yeah, and this has got to be talked about. I mean, I, we are coming into, I think, a very difficult period for, for um, British politics on this issue because we have had almost nothing from the government on this issue of costs. So, I mean, I can give you, and I will give you the, um, you know, the, 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 the aggregate story for the, for the economy. Which is, which is very clear that as we've seen the cost fall of the alternative energy technologies that we've talked about, particularly from renewables, uh, 
we can look forward to more and more to a, a very low cost transition to net zero. It's actually cost beneficial in some areas to, to move away now from fossil fuel uh, technologies. So most notably in the, in the transport sector, when we look at the cars and vans on our roads, uh, very quickly in the next couple of years, potentially, we will reach a price tipping point where it's actually cheaper uh, to, to own and run uh, an electric car or electric van than it is a fossil fueled one. So that kind of saving is there. But there is no doubt that there is real cost in some areas of this transition. And unfortunately, for, for, for our politicians at least, they fall in, those costs fall in some pretty sensitive areas. So, you know, the cost of heating decarbonisation, so decarbonising homes and buildings, offices, buildings, buildings across the UK, that is a real cost. It's going to, be, it's going to be, have to be supported in some way by the Exchequer, uh, but we've had nothing at all from the government on what their outlook on that is. And then the other area that is a, a, a major cost driver is the cost of industry decarbonisation itself. So there are industries who, if we ask them to shoulder the cost of decarbonisation, it will make them, uh, it, it, will, it will damage their competitiveness. So again, that is a, an issue that we need uh, the, the, the government to pay attention to. So standing back from this, and it's important to do that, the, the kind of costs that we're talking about now are less than 1% of GDP in every year of the transition to net zero now, actually closer to zero in our central assessment. Uh, and that's underneath that is that story that I've just talked about where you have savings in some area, areas and some real costs in other areas. So there is a challenge here for the chancellor to pick up, to capture some of the savings from especially that surface transport transition that I've talked about. To use that to pay for the costs in other areas is an, is an aggregate challenge that really we only have the Treasury, um, uh, the Treasury really needs to own that as a, as a topic. But beneath that challenge, uh, there is a kind of more real sense about where we draw the line between uh, those consumers, be they businesses or individuals, that can afford to pay for some of this and those that can't. And again, that is an area where the Treasury has said almost nothing. So I, I do look to the Treasury because I think a lot of this will need to be supported with fiscal policies. Uh, a lot of it, though, can be driven with uh, solid commitments and regulations. Uh, and they tend to be the kind of things that drive a uh, you know, pro-market response, the innovation that we need, the cost will fall. So again, a strategy for all of this would really help, which was the point we were trying to make last week, that we are now suffering, I think, from the lack of that coherent strategy from the government. It's fine to have the Climate Change Committee spell out how we think the transition should look, but we are here to give advice. We're not, in, we're not a regulator. We don't set policies directly. So it's time for the government to, um, to come up with something that looks more coherent. Tom, the best case scenario, and there are certainly reasons to be hopeful, is that costs do fall and that thing, you know, um, assets like electric vehicles do become affordable for, for your average consumer. But then there are also the tough choices when it comes to behavior that are really difficult to sell as well. The decision, for example, to cut back even slightly on the amount of meat that one might eat or to fly slightly less, to, to, to change your lifestyle. Um, that, that that's a conversation again that you know businesses and government don't really want to have and um, nobody it seems very often apart from Chris is is highlighting this to people as we talk about the trade-offs of, of trying to meet these targets because as a business you know very often you're trying to get people to consume more it's not it's not very um, business friendly uh, in this in this scenario to try to convince people to roll back um. I think if you look at it, um, a lot of research has been done on future consumers, not current consumers. And mm. there's a very, very clear shift towards people who want to consume better rather than consume more. And I think that's something we really need to acknowledge. Um, it's a global phenomenon, but it's as alive and well in the UK as it is anywhere. Um, so I think we're going to start thinking about consumption in a different way. And there are two things that are really important here. One is understanding what our environmental impact is. And it might be through eating meat versus not eating meat, which kind of meat, by the way, versus something else. It might be uh, to do with transport, the relative merits of train versus plane. Um, because if you actually understand where your carbon footprint lies, you can make some smart, informed choices. It would not be completely unrealistic to say somebody very close to me, maybe some member of my family, is somewhere I have to fly to. And as a result, I'm going to offset that impact by choosing to be vegan. I mean, it, it's the numbers add up, not in every case, but the numbers could add up. So you can make smart choices about where you want your environmental impact to lie. 
And what we're hearing is that people who want to consume better rather than consume more is because better is something that they very firmly get anchored in. Just let me ask one really simple question. Can anybody remember what a car phone looks like? Because interestingly, this thing's come along instead. <laughs> this is very expensive, by the way, compared to almost any form of car phone or any other form of, of transport um, related communication. And yet we all love this. This is something which has changed the way in which we as consumers live our lives. Um, and there are gonna be other examples coming forward. So I, I don't think anybody's dodging the question around cost. The vast majority of businesses that we work with absolutely develop a net zero plan on the basis that it is cost effective and a good business case for them because they know that what's coming along is gonna be more efficient, it's ultimately gonna be cheaper, it's gonna meet consumer needs in a better way. So Chris is absolutely right on all of those. But there are some, some pinch points in terms of behaviors and I don't think we should be afraid to have those discussions. They're perfectly reasonable. You can the vast majority of people in the UK are starting to look at their diet and think about it in a different way. And there is already a significant shift towards um, you know, more of a flexitarian diet than, than we would have had 10, 15 years ago. So let's have that discussion and, and not be afraid of it. I think politicians sometimes look at it and think, oh, I, I, I don't dare go here. I think they're missing the point that a whole younger generation expects them to go there. Kate, can I come in on that? Because yeah. it's such an important issue overall. I, I firmly agree with everything that Tom has just said. Uh, but just to put some numbers around this, there is indeed a, a, a strong benefit to changing the nation's diet. Now, the benefit is also in the form of health improvements. And interestingly, the government already has guidelines for health that set out a much more extreme change in diet than anything that we would recommend. So we're talking about cutting a fifth of meat consumption out of, um, uh, out of diets today uh, over the course of the next decade and, and more. Now, it's not necessary to do that, but it will help immensely if we do. And it's worth just understanding why that is, because firstly, we have that health improvement that I talked about. Secondly, it's, it will allow us to free up agricultural land, which is actually used in, it's quite wasteful actually, in terms of the land that's necessary uh, to have grazing animals on it when, of course, there are alternatives to what we could do with that land. So what we're talking about is freeing up some of that land to then do something else. And really important connecting factor with this, and this is the point that I make regularly, is that is to the farming community who often feel embattled or attacked by this, and I, I, I desperately hope that they won't be, feel that way, is that there is an opportunity that comes from freeing up that land. Uh, I'm desperate to make this point that if we get the the, the policy frameworks in the right place, if DEFRA as the kind of lead department for this does the job that I hope it will, then we will start to think of carbon itself as a crop. And this idea of, of storing the carbon on that land should be a lucrative opportunity for British farmers. So if we connect all this together, just to deal solely with the diet issues, we're talking about a healthier diet for the nation, uh, probably speaking directly to consumers in this country and saying to them, eat a little less meat, but eat high quality meat that is produced and reared here in the UK. And we're saying to the farming community, there are a set of commercial opportunities that at present are not available to you uh, as that transition takes place. And again, if we don't have that strategy from the government and the leadership from government, then it, it becomes a, a discussion solely about uh, diet change, which of course is, is perceived as an attack by consumers. And, and, and I, it needs to be thought of in the round. And the last thing I'll say on this, because it comes out really strongly in our analysis, I am not proposing taxes on meat. Uh, uh, there is that suggestion from some uh, in the environmental community, but it's not come from us. So this kind of transition can come from uh, stronger signposting information provision, uh, perhaps going at the extreme to, to, to better labeling on food, but nothing more than that. Uh, and Tom's point about the generational divide is a real one. I, I think we will, we, will, we will make that kind of transition towards a healthier diet inevitably because you can see it in the in the um in the diet shift uh, in the diet uh, in in the in the in the type of diet that we have uh, if you look at older people and younger people uh, there is already a move towards that flexitarian diet that, that tom talked about so i don't think this should be regarded as uh, frontline in the climate discussions or frontline in the culture wars because it, it really is a it's the kind of transition that we're on already mm. 
And you're discussing it as voluntary, of course, which, as you say, is, is different to how, how others are calling for it at the moment. Yeah. Um, with only a, a few minutes left, um, last question um, to, to everyone, and, and Scott, I'll start with you. Um, as companies go along this journey to decarbonization, is it helpful or even possible to have a standard way of comparing them to one another? Or are we still in a phase where simply encouraging companies to do the best that they can for their sector, where that technological advancement and where their customers are at now allows them to do? Is that perhaps the right way to go about it? Or do we really need to hunker down to see where companies and which companies are pulling their weight? Scott, let's start with you. Yeah, I think it's really tricky at the moment from what I can see to have a, a standard that everybody uh, follows. One of the things that we want to do is open up what we're doing and share that with other businesses if they want to comment on it, um, look at it and to try and try and do that together. But like I said at the start, I think right now it's about turning up and showing up to make that impact and, and actually getting on with something. Um, you know, I think that we're about two thirds of the way of what we we believe we need to do and we've still got to work out. Um, another third of that so that's how it can become difficult and we think we'll work out that third pretty quickly as we're engineers by uh, by trade and and by our history but I think it's difficult for us to have a standard um, that's set but you do also need to you know make sure that you have those targets in place um, and you report those targets so everyone can see uh, what you're doing. Tom? Yeah, I think the, the challenge really is that we're trying to make change happen a lot quicker than we would normally uh, expect. Markets do deliver. Um, the trouble is here, the market won't deliver fast enough to meet the needs of the planet. Uh, we need to decarbonize far quicker than a market solution alone would uh, allow. So we need the stimulus from government. We need uh, consumers who are willing and, and indeed keen to engage on this. But I do think the financial community has something to bring here. Uh, net zero, by the way, is pretty much a standard approach that you can take, but it's challenging without the full disclosure and transparency we've been talking about. TCFD is going to be an incredibly powerful tool. The Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures applied across all listed companies within the UK and being used as a model for financial disclosure globally now um, is an incredibly powerful potential tool. It'll provide that transparency. It'll address many of the concerns that we have around greenwash. And to your point around, is there a standard? You can't have a standard because every, com every company essentially has to go on its own journey. It's going to have its own challenges. It's going to need to get to a certain point. The TCFD approach allows you to look at what you're doing at the moment. It allows you to look at future scenarios and incorporate that in a full disclosure. I, I would argue if we had to do one thing, it's mandate TCFD straight away. Chris? Yes, I, I completely agree with the TCFD point. And I think it is possible to commit to a standard of, of, of net zero by, by committing to the actions that the country needs to take to get there as well. So I think that combination of TCFD plus, plus a broad statement of commitment to net zero is important. But really important to say that, that, that it does depend on what sector you're in. Uh, you, the, the actions that you need to take as a corporate to align with that transition that we've been talking about will vary by sector. So it is important to, to think carefully about what those, 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 those solutions look like, depending on what the sector is. And I'll just give a brief plug to a piece of advice that we offered in December on that very issue. So we looked at the role of, of businesses in delivering net zero, and uh, we set out uh, some of the actions that, could, that the corporate community could take, depending on which sector they find themselves in. So if, if you're at all interested in that, it's a really accessible document. You can find it on our, on our website. Uh, well, uh, Tom, Scott, and Chris, uh, thank you so much for joining me. And again, thank you to our sponsor, Velux, uh, for making this possible. Now, please stay tuned for our next panel in today's summit, uh, Green and Global Britain, where Katie Balls, our deputy political editor, will be joined by an esteemed panel to discuss global trade and how that feeds in to the climate agenda. But again, a big thanks to our panel. I wish we could thank you in the usual way. I'm sure people are clapping at home. Uh, do stay with us for our next panel coming up in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm.